how is everyone? You guys, you guys doing good? It was close to three years ago now, I lay in a silent world, in a medically induced coma for around a month. I actually passed away three times on the operating table, but yet, you know, here I am and I'm so grateful to be here today and to share my story with all of you. As you've just heard, in 2011, I was badly burned during the Kimberley Ultra Marathon. There was no way that I could have known that that was the day when my life would change forever. My journey back to recovery, it's been incredibly tough. I've had to learn how to walk again, how to talk again, even how to wipe my own behind, which I know sounds like a little thing, but the first time I was able to do it, it felt like I'd won the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've had to overcome so much as well. You know, the transformation of my appearance, the loss of my independence, the ongoing nature of my rehabilitation. What I've learned on my journey though, is that the strength of the human mind, of, of our minds, it's astonishing. Its ability to overcome adversity and its capacity to fight back will, you know, it'll amaze you. I was actually in hospital last month for my right hand, so can everyone just hold out their hands? And can you see how you've got a, a distance or a spacing between all of your fingers and your thumb? And now squeeze it up tight together so that, so that there's no gaps, no spacing. That's how my hand healed. So I couldn't use any of my fingers and so what the operation was for, it was to release all of my digits. I could get prosthetics for it, but I wouldn't be able to use them, they'd just be for show and I want to be able to use my hand functionally and normally, which I can do now. I can tie up my shoelaces, I can cut my food with a knife and fork, I can do up the fly in my jeans and you know, I've been thinking about it. I'm actually really proud of this hand and I actually think it looks like Bart Simpson's hand. <laughs> it does, it does. I've got, I've got four fingers and they're all short and stumpy. So, I don't know. I reckon I might stay with my Bart Simpson hand for quite some time yet. I actually wore that mask for two long years and, you know, looking back on it, I probably should have rubbed a few banks. <laughs> Well, that might have paid for some operations. Um, naturally, I hated wearing my mask. I, I couldn't eat with it on. People couldn't read my facial expressions and it was, it was so uncomfortable. As the months turned into years, I, I got used to it. And I came to realise that all of us wear masks. And not only do we all wear masks, but we all wear different masks too. You know, with our work, with our friends, with our families, with our partners. Why are we so afraid of letting people see who we really are? You know, what sort of mask might you be wearing? What would happen if you just, I don't know, you just took it off? I am really lucky to have found my partner, Michael. I don't need to wear a mask when I'm with him. I remember this one incident in hospital. I had two physios around me trying to help me climb this teeny weeny little stair. And Michael, he was just clapping and cheering and carrying on as if I'd just won a triathlon. And I know this sounds terrible, but I just lost it at him. I said, <laughs> people with a weird sense of humour over there. <laughs> I, I said, you know, what are you cheering for? There's nothing to celebrate, mate. I'm a, I'm a bloody cripple. I'm not proud of what I did or how I acted, but it was just how I was feeling at the time. I was frustrated, you know, and I was embarrassed too because I was supposed to be an elite athlete and now I couldn't even walk a single step. Michael came back the next day at seven in the morning and he was there with me from seven in the morning till seven at night, day after day, week after week, month after month. So he's a pretty special bloke. But 
I reckon I'm pretty special too. <laughs> and after the fire, someone asked Michael's mum why Michael was still with me. And, you know, when I found that out, I was so hurt because I felt as if people had only valued me because of my looks, not because I'm smart, gritty, determined. All of us here in this room are all so much more than just our bodies. But mind you, as a teenager, it was all about looking good. <laughs> in fact, my grades were awful, and then one day I decided I wanted to do well in the HSC. And so when I told Mr Smith my subject choices, he went, <laughs> you're not smart enough. I was infuriated, but I used his negativity as motivation. In fact, he was the catalyst for forging me into a new direction. I ended up coming first in all my subjects. I got a mark in the high 90s and I won the math medal. So, go suck it, Mr Smith. <laughs> I'm going to fast forward a bit now and take you to that moment which would become so pivotal in my lifetime. I was a quarter of the way through the 100 kilometres of the Outback Ultra Marathon. I had my music headphones in to help pump me up, you know, to help me get through the Ultra. And I started to hear a rumbling, so I took my headphones out. Yeah, a rumbling but getting louder, and I knew that I was close to the highway, so I assumed then that this rumbling was the sound of road trains roaring down the road. That, that spurred me on, that made me increase the pace with which I was running because I, I knew, or I thought, I was so close to the next stage of the ultra. So, to take you back to the day. I was running, looking down at the ground, exhausted. And then I remember looking up and just being faced with this wall of flames. I remember that split-second decision I had to make. Do I stay on the valley floor knowing that the shoulder-high dry spin effects would be perfect fuel for the flames? Or do I run up the hill knowing full well that fires travel faster uphill? In the end, I chose the hill and I started running. And when the fire finally caught me, I just remember looking down at my hands and arms and. You know, they were both ablaze. I was screaming with terror and I remember thinking, this is it. I'm never going to see Michael again. After the fire had passed, I was still screaming because it all felt so surreal, like I was watching a bad horror movie. And sobbing and crying, I checked my feet and my legs and I checked my hands and my arms and in my distressed state, they all seemed fine. And so I got this huge rush of elation because I was alive and for some reason I thought about work and how this would make a great discussion point at our weekly safety meetings. <laughs> oh no, work always gets into your personal life, doesn't it? <laughs> all I wanted to do was get out of there, but we were trapped on that lonely hillside for four hours. And that hot Kimberley sun was burning my already burnt skin. Finally, the paramedics from Kananara arrived and I immediately recognised one of the volunteers because I used to volunteer with her on the weekends. So I said, hey Bonnie, how are you? She, she just gave me a blank look. She didn't even recognise me. So I said, it's me, it's Terea. Now, she didn't say anything back, but I just noticed a tear start to roll slowly down her face and, you know, that, that's when it clicked. Something very bad has happened. I ended up staying in hospital for six long months and, you know, hospital, that was where the real work began. I had physiotherapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, every day and 
all of that stuff hurt so much, but it was nothing in comparison to my daily bandage changes. I would actually lie awake at night and I, I would sweat at the thought of the inevitable bandage change to come the next day. And in the morning you could hear the screams of other Burns patients while their bandages were being changed and, you know, that anticipation of the pain, it, it made it all the worse. But don't worry, I did try to be sneaky. <laughs> no, nurse, I already changed it. All good in room 28. Feels fine. <laughs> they never bought it. Ten minutes later, I was screaming along with the rest of them. <laughs> well, one of the consequences of the fire was that my elbows had ossified, and ossified just means I was stuck. I could bend them around this far in the beginning. And if you can't bend your elbows, you can't wash your face, brush your hair, dress yourself, take yourself to the bathroom. It, it was because of the lack of movement in my elbows that I was totally... Actually, we're going to do a little exercise. Everyone hold out your arms. <laughs> We've got a room full of zombies. <laughs> All right, now pretend you've got a spoon of delicious ice cream in your hand. Your mouth is salivating, thinking about eating it. And now try and eat it, but don't bend your elbows. Ah, oh, some of you guys aren't even trying. <laughs> Clearly we've got some diabetics in the room. <laughs> a couple of you at the back are very inventive. You know, the first time I could bend my elbow enough to feed myself, my whole family and I, we actually cried. We were all so ecstatic that I could do this simple everyday task that most of us would take for granted. And sh shouldn't we celebrate these little things in life? You know, the fact that we're able to feed ourselves, the fact that we're able to communicate with one another, the fact that we're able to wash our faces with clean water straight from the taps. There is so much in our lives to be thankful for. Even, even the generosity of others. When I moved home from hospital, I actually didn't live with my family. I lived with Michael's family. How beautiful is that? For a year and a half, they cared for me like I was their own daughter. And all of us, really, we all deserve to be loved and cared for. And not only do we deserve the best from others, but we deserve the best from ourselves. I've always thought highly of myself. It's not because I'm not myself. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just proud of the person that I am. I, I was asked to be the cover girl of the Women's Weekly a couple of months ago. And the Women's Weekly is Australia's highest circulating magazine. I was astounded by how much media coverage I got and by how many emails I got of women and men who were writing to me every day saying, I, I hate my face, I hate my arms, I hate my legs, I hate my bum. What a waste, eh? What a waste of energy that those brilliant individuals were spending all of that time worrying about how they looked as opposed to what they could contribute. You know, having self-belief, having self-confidence, having self-love, it's got nothing to do with what you see. And it's got everything to do with, with what's up here. Our mind, it's the most powerful weapon that we will ever have. With our minds, we can delve into the unknown. We can uncover new possibilities. We can take risks. You know, as a kid, I loved to read. I could enter a world constructed purely by my imagination and I would use that imagination when I would run. So I would imagine that I was a messenger for a queen and I had to get a message to her, otherwise a war would break out and I'd have the deaths of thousands of people on my hands. I know it's, it's a bit weird, but <laughs> it kept me going. In fact, while I was in hospital covered head to toe with bandages, I would imagine that I was a SAS soldier who had been blown up whilst on patrol in Afghanistan. By perceiving myself as that bloke who was hard as nails, I immediately started to toughen up. 
I really reckon that the power of our minds, it's incredible. My doctors told my family that I would never run again and I was back running in 2012, not even a year after my accident. Not only is the importance of our minds undervalued, so too is time. You know, we've all got this idea in our heads that time is infinite, that there's always tomorrow or next week or next year. But time, it's our most valuable resource. We can't mine for any more of it. We can't extract it from the earth. But yet, it's running out for all of us here in this room. The crazy part is, we have no idea when our time will be up. You know, you've got a choice. Do you wait for disaster to happen and then find out how amazing you are? Or, in this point in time, do you say, I am extraordinary and there's more I have to give? I'm not going to say that I found an incredible strength after my accident because I thought I was pretty awesome beforehand. <laughs> This year I've done the variety cycle from Sydney to Uluru, the 20k Lake Argyle swim. I've met this woman, I don't want to drop any names, but that is Princess Kate. <laughs> I've climbed a section of the Great Wall of China and I've just come back from sailing around French Polynesia. I'm organising another fundraising walk for Interplast on the Inca Trail next year and when I ask people to join me, you should hear some of their excuses. Oh, it's too far, I'm too fat, I'm too boring, I'm too busy. It's, it's crazy the excuses people use to keep themselves stuck because if you really want to do something, you can always find a way to make it happen. Yes. In a way, I'm, I'm trapped by my body. It doesn't let me do all of the things that it used to, but a lot, of a lot of people are trapped too. They're trapped up here. They're trapped by years of negative conditioning in there. They're paralysed by their mindset. All of us here in this room, we're all so much stronger and so much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. And all we need to do to unmask our full potential is uncover the possibilities that lie up here. Hey, thanks so much, guys.